Good afternoon to all. So, warm welcome to the today's uh, Deep Circle Foundation course. So, I am <clears throat> today's our session on uh, gastrointestinal syndromes. I am excited to introduce uh, Dr. Talami from uh, New Zealand. She is a palliative care physician. So, she is with us uh, from November onwards. So, I am we invite her to take over the session. Good afternoon. I have a funny New Zealand accent. If you cannot understand what I'm saying and you need someone to translate my accent, please put your hand up and Sister Sheba or Dr. Sunil may be able to help out with the pronunciation of some words. As Sheba said, today's session is on gastrointestinal symptoms. In particular today, I will be teaching you about the assessment and management of nausea and vomiting and the assessment and management of constipation. Can you all hear me okay? We're going to go to the PowerPoint. So I wanted to start our discussion about nausea and vomiting with a definition of the various terms that we use. As nurses and doctors, we very easily uh, use these terms, nausea, vomiting, retching, regurgitation. But these are strange terms to patients. And when we take a history, we actually need to be very clear about what it is that the patient is describing and in fact what it is that they are suffering with. So for us with a medical background, uh, nausea means that unpleasant feeling of the need to vomit and I think that it is something that we have all experienced even from our childhood and it makes us feel so miserable and is often associated with a rapid heart rate, sweating, and even a wanting to withdraw because we're so miserable. And then vomiting is actually when the contents of our stomach are uh, forcefully um, exposed into the room. Retching is the muscular contractions of vomiting without actually anything coming from our stomach. And regurgitation is really, um, there is usually very little nausea and it's the backflow of undigested food up the esophagus. So it is very important um, if a patient says they are vomiting to actually determine what is happening for them. So I would like um, some participation if perhaps everybody could give us one cause uh, for nausea and vomiting. And I'll ask Sister Sheba to help us to coordinate this. If you would like to put your hand up, we can unmute you. Oh, chemotherapeutic drugs. Dr. Yeah, chemotherapy drugs. Very good. Malignancy, Tina. stomach. Tina? Gastroenteritis, just um, the usual stomach upset. Yep. Infection, good. Enough NSAID, NSAID, long term use of the NSAID. So, gastritis from NSAID use? Yep. Gastroenteritis. Gastroenteritis. 
their strange writers. <laughs> Any other causes of nausea and vomiting? May I suggest one? Thank you, Odette. Bowel obstruction? Yeah, bowel obstruction. Brain mets. Brain metastases. Dr. Manoj. Dr. Somaraju. Raised by CT, ma'am. We can't hear you. Raised by CT. Raised intracranial tension. Raised intracranial pressure. Thank you. Thank you. So for our group of palliative patients, there are many, many potential causes of nausea and vomiting. It, why is it important for us to manage uh, nausea and vomiting in our patients? It's because this feeling and the experience is one of the most distressing symptoms for our patients. At the time that we meet palliative patients, a third of them are experiencing nausea and vomiting, and up to three quarters will be, have this symptom by their final week of life. Many patients tell us in many studies that nausea can be more distressing than pain itself. Patients who suffer from prolonged nausea and vomiting can become very uh, weak and withdrawn they can become dehydrated, they can have nutritional deficits, electrolyte imbalances, and can even develop aspiration pneumonia. For these reasons, it is an important symptom for us to be able to control well. Vomiting is believed to be controlled by two distinct brain centers. They are both in the brain stem. One is the vomiting center and the other is the chemoreceptor trigger zone. They are not an anatomical area, they are physiological areas that researchers have worked out uh, are the main centers for coordinating um, the pathway from uh, a toxin or something happening in the body to actually uh, the body vomiting. The antiemetic drugs that we use work by inhibition of neurotransmitters at the receptive sites found in the chemoreceptor trigger zone, the vomiting complex, and in the gut. There are other, other, there are other receptor sites in the body, but it's mainly those three places that antiemetics work at. This is a, a picture uh, that shows the parts of the body that contribute uh, to the patient vomiting. As we can see, there is uh, the brain with the, the higher centers, the cortex, and then the brain stem with the chemoreceptor trigger zone and uh, the vomiting center. Then there's the gut and then the balance organs. All can contribute um, to vomiting. Uh, a patient may have one, two, or three reasons why they have nausea and vomiting. The coloured patches next to the parts of the body are the various um, neurotransmitters that uh, are implicated at each site. Uh, it is not at all black and white, and that many researchers are still really trying to get to the bottom of how nausea and vomiting works and how best to control it.
the main two antiemetics that we use to control nausea and vomiting are metoclopramide and haloperidol. Metoclopramide makes up about half of the prescriptions that will be made for palliative care patients in India. Metoclopramide works by inhibiting dopamine receptors and at very high doses it also inhibits serotonin receptors. It works as a prokinetic. Uh, it gets the gut moving. Uh, it enables food and fluid to move along um, from the stomach through the small intestine. The other main antiemetic we use is haloperidol, which is about a quarter of all the prescriptions used in palliative patients. And it inhibits mainly dopamine, but also histamine and serotonin receptors. So you see it has a broader uh, range of action than metoclopramide. And haloperidol would be the, the drug that we went to for most chemical causes of vomiting. So as we've seen, nausea and vomiting can be due to several factors. And really, uh, as doctors and nurses, uh, our job is to solve the mystery of the patient in front of us with nausea and vomiting. We need to take a detailed history and examination. We need to be aware of their past medical history and the investigations that have been done to date and, and the diagnosis and what might be causing the patient's symptom. We may need to do further investigations to determine any reversible cause such as a blood tests to check for high calcium or kidney failure. If a patient is getting near the end of life, in the last days of life, it may not be appropriate um, to do blood tests to determine the cause of their nausea and vomiting because uh, those causes may not be reversible in the time that the patient has left. So the next two slides I have um, categorised the different causes of nausea and vomiting. The causes that I have underlined uh, on the slide, gastric stasis, bowel obstruction, biochemical abnormalities, and drugs account for most of the causes of nausea and vomiting in our palliative patients. So nausea and vomiting caused by vagal and sympathetic pathways includes cough. So some patients, uh, perhaps with lung cancer, will have uh, uh, a terrible cough uh, that just goes on and on and on so much so that they vomit at the end of the paroxysm of coughing. An enlarged liver can cause nausea. Gastric stasis, that's a slowing down of the gut, either by uh, drugs or um, by tumour in the, in the bowel, can cause nausea and vomiting. Constipation itself can cause nausea and vomiting, bowel obstruction, and gastritis. Those causes uh, that are mediated in the chemoreceptor trigger zone are biochemical abnormalities, such as uremia and hypercalcemia, and also drugs, such as opioids or cytotoxics, uh, chemotherapy drugs, and other drugs, such as digoxin. Some nausea and vomiting is um, mediated through the higher centres, such as fear and anxiety. And uh, there are a few chemotherapy patients who will get anticipatory nausea at the very thought of, of having their chemotherapy for the day, or perhaps when they walk through the door of the chemotherapy suite or when the IV line goes in. So they get nausea and vomiting before they've even received any chemotherapy. The vomiting centre can be affected um, by radiotherapy to the head or raised intracranial pressure, which is putting pressure on the brainstem. 
and causing nausea and vomiting. And damage to the vestibular nerve can cause nausea and vomiting. And some brain, uh, base of skull, bony metastases can cause nausea and vomiting by this mechanism. So as we start to solve the mystery of the patient in front of us who has nausea and vomiting, we need to think if there is anything that can be corrected. It may be that the patient in front of you has already tried oral antiemetics, but because of the severity of their nausea and vomiting, they are unable to keep them down. In which case, we need to go to a different route of administration. So IV or subcutaneous uh, is, could, can be used depending on your situation. Not, one is not better than the other, but they are both very, very good to, to bypass the oral route. Sometimes a patient will need just one um, subcut or IV administration to overcome their symptom and after that they will be fine back on oral and antiemetics. Some patients, such as those with bowel obstruction, will never be able to get back onto oral antiemetics. Uh, next week I will teach you on the management of bowel obstruction so we will learn more about that. So the best treatment for gastric stasis for a gut that is slowed down is metoclopramide. The best treatment for a metabolic nausea and vomiting, such as that caused by kidney failure or hypercalcemia or opioids, will be haloperidol. We need to manage the constipation. So for some patients, the only cause for their nausea and vomiting is constipation. It's important to work on that. We can improve someone's terrible cough with the use of opioids. If they have a lot of respiratory secretions that is making them vomit, we can also use medications to dry them up, such as drugs like hyacinth. If a patient has a very large liver, which is uh, pressing on their duodenum and stomach, we can use dexamethasone to help reduce that swelling. For those patients who become uh, nauseated due to anxiety, a benzodiazepine can be very effective and they are used by oncology teams. Raised intracranial pressure or radiotherapy to the head can cause nausea, which um, can be controlled with dexamethasone and or on dancitron. You may notice that I have not uh, mentioned on dancitron before now, and on dancitron is used uh, very frequently by our radiation and medical oncology colleagues uh, appropriately for uh, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting and radiation induced uh, nausea and vomiting. But for our patients that have finished their course of chemotherapy and radiation, uh, ondansetron is really not an effective uh, antiemetic and in fact it causes more problems uh, due to the side effect of constipation. Intestinal obstruction uh, can be treated medically and I've suggested a combination of haloperidol, dexamethasone, and ranitidine. But once more, we will talk about that uh, next week at length. And for those patients who are suffering with nausea and vomiting on movement, uh, suggesting that it's to do, it's affecting their balance organs, then a meclizine can be used. For those patients who have gastritis causing nausea, then it is important to stop their NSAID and start a gastroprotector, such as pantoprazole or ranitidine. A 
I wanted to talk about, in particular, opioid-induced nausea and vomiting, because 30% of patients that we start on a strong opioid will experience nausea and vomiting as a short-term side effect. As we've mentioned in previous weeks, it's really important uh, when we start a patient on an opioid for the first time to make sure that they have an antiemetic also prescribed and available so that they can start this if they start to feel nauseated. If the nausea is mild, then metoclopramide can be effective. Uh, if it is more severe, haloperidol may be used. I guess you might ask why we don't give, just give everybody haloperidol. Haloperidol is very sedating, and uh, many people uh, don't like that sedation feeling, so they would rather try with metoclopramide first if their symptoms, symptoms are not too severe. Every now and then, a patient will uh, have quite severe nausea and vomiting from the opioid, in which case metoclopramide and haloperidol can be used in combination. There are other measures that we can do to and suggest to help our patients with nausea and vomiting, which includes controlling all those things that make them feel worse. So making sure that any odor from the colostomy or wounds is kept to a minimum. Avoiding the sight and smell of foods and cooking and avoiding those foods which worsen their nausea. They may also prefer to have small frequent snacks and drinks rather than main meals. So that's all that I had um, prepared for nausea and vomiting. That's halfway through the presentation today. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we move on to the next section. Can everybody understand me okay? Gina can. I know Odette can because she's got an Australian accent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the, the take home message really for nausea and vomiting is that yes, it is complex, uh, but it is really important to think about the cause and correct anything that can be corrected. And then really, if you can uh, gain experience and confidence with using both metoclopramide and haloperidol, you've covered um, at least 75% of the palliative patients that will need help with nausea and vomiting. So moving on to constipation. So once more, constipation is one of those words that we as doctors and nurses understand well but it is uh, fascinating and interesting and amazing uh, how different the definition can be uh, for patients if you really try to get to the bottom of what they mean by constipation. But what we're talking about today uh, is constipation being difficult, painful, and infrequent defecation of hard stools. This is an important 
symptom for our group of patients because 80% of palliative care patients will need help to establish a regular bowel habit. And in fact, 90% of the patients that we start on opioids uh, will need extra help. So it is important to elicit a clear history, which includes from the patient what their bowel habit was previously and what the recent changes have been for them. We also want to know if they have any other associated symptoms, such as abdominal pain, abdominal distension, vomiting, or diarrhea. Why would a patient who, if we're asking about constipation, why are we interested in whether or not they have diarrhea? Can anybody tell me? Alternating constipation and diarrhea may be the sign of an irritable bowel syndrome and not, not such a uh, uh, drug induced because of opiates. Sorry, Dr. Barat, we couldn't hear you at the start. Can you say that again, please? Uh, the history of diarrhea in a patient with constipation may be important uh, because uh, uh, he may have an irritable bowel syndrome in which there is a fluctuate alternating constipation and diarrhea or similar picture. So uh, if the patient has history of diarrhea, then probably he is not having constipation because of the drug induced. So there, there are, there are patients that have irritable bowel syndrome. That there, and there is another reason why we want to ask about diarrhea. Odette, would you like to tell us why we are interested in diarrhea in patients with a history of constipation? Um, I, I'm wondering, one, it can be difficult to, uh, to uh, pick up, pay, to, di to distinguish between diarrhea and constipation sometimes, meaning that um, there's a condition, there's something called overflow diarrhea where um, patients who are quite, actually quite constipated may complain of in bowel incontinence or so-called diarrhea um, because that, they, they kind of have leakage around the, the constipated area. Um, so that is one, one issue that can be quite hard to sort out clinically um, because you kind of end up giving counter intuitive advice about taking more laxative when the patient comes to you complaining of diarrhea. So um, it needs to be carefully, a careful history, a careful examination, sometimes an x-ray of the bowel might be necessary to really sort that out. Thank you, Odette. So if, if we elicit a history of someone who has had constipation for two weeks on opioids and then, but they say, it's all right now, but I'm, actually I've got diarrhea now. So that may suggest, uh, now what, what we call it is constipation with overflow, but what, what you call it here, I think is spurious diarrhea. <coughs> so it's, it's diarrhea when we're least expecting it. <coughs> so don't be put off with a history of diarrhea, especially in a patient who's on opioids. It may be that they have a whole lot of hard uh, feces in their descending colon and a whole lot of liquid feces coming around the outside 
and, and as Odette said, sometimes they can actually be incontinent with that as well. So if a patient gives a history of constipation, of hard, difficult stools, it's important to examine them. It's, in, it's important to put your hand on their abdomen. Is their abdomen distended? It's important to have a listen to the abdomen. Are their bowel sounds normal or increased or reduced? It can be very difficult to um, determine if a patient has constipation <coughs> or is actually going into bowel obstruction. In very thin patients, you, you may be able to feel uh, hard stools in the line of the descending colon. If the patient has not passed a bowel motion for over three days, or is, has a very um, has pain or discomfort in their rectum, then it, it is important to do a rectal examination to find out if the rectum is full of hard or soft feces. Because for these patients, uh, a rectal intervention, which we will talk about soon, uh, can give them a great deal of relief. But if the rectum is is empty, um, then a rectal intervention is really not going to help. So um, what I would like to all contribute, if possible, is to give me, each of you to give me a co possible cause for constipation. All of the things that we need to think of at, um, as doctors when we have a patient in front of us who says they're constipated. Gina's raised hand. Lack of, lack of the face in the night, most common. Irregular bowel habits. <laughs> So, uh, other than as a side effect of opioids, there is also the um, as a side effect of dehydration or malnutrition. So we've got um, opioids, dehydration, and malnutrition. Thank yes, Gina. Other causes? Lack of the fit in the right. Lack of roughage in the right. Fiber. A low fiber. Yeah. So diet, yes. Bowel obstruction, ma'am. Bowel obstruction, yep. Decreased bowel motility. Sorry? Decreased bowel motility, ma'am. Decreased bowel motility. Decreased bowel motility. Thank you. Dr. Barani Um. So that may be in critical patients, it is because of hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. Dr. Barani? Yeah, it could be due to low diet intake with a less amount of fiber content. Yeah. Okay. Not much of solid food. Dr. Gobu? Can, can anybody suggest any other drugs that cause constipation apart from opioids? So another group of drugs that we use often in palliative care are the tricyclic antidepressants, which 
just have constipation as a side effect. So, um, can I can yes. I add to that? Um, I mean, I think the impact of drugs is huge, really, in this area. And so many drugs have a kind of hidden anticholinergic action. It's often worth, it's worth just taking a look at that, um, uh, Googling it or something, and just seeing the number of drugs that actually do have an anticholinergic component to them. And many of them we, uh, we do use in end-of-life care or symptom management. Um, so it's very additive. And then you add a bit of dehydration. Um, and then also just debility, People, you know, loss of muscle tone. People don't have the strength to evacuate sometimes. And, and it may be around their sort of anal sphincter and their pelvic muscles, but also their abdominal muscles, you know. They, um, and then the lack of privacy. Often people are shy to... Um, go to the toilet in public spaces, hospitals, and so on. So it's very cumulative um, and very under-recognised and a major source of feeling unwell um, in hospitals and also a, so a cause of delirium, uh, particularly in the ill, the elderly. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of an area that we leave to the nurses, but it's actually a very, very major cause of being unwell um, and can lead, and can have a spin on, you know, the delirious patient who then falls, who then fractures something. So it's it's actually it's very important symptom. Um, I agree, it is an important symptom, and I think that um, you know palliative. Um, specialist units all over the world uh, continue to have a significant number of admissions simply for constipation. Um, and it is, people can die of constipation. They go into bowel obstruction and they die. So it is a very important symptom uh, to, to understand and to be able to um, overcome. So I, I grouped some of the causes of constipation. So those Causes that are cancer related uh, include hypercalcemia, spinal cord compression, dehydration from nausea and vomiting, and intestinal obstruction. Treatment related causes include the opioids, the anticholinergic drugs, and as I mentioned earlier, on Dancitron. And as Odette mentioned, that Debility itself can cause constipation. Um, elderly people who are weak and in pain will avoid having to get up and go to the toilet, and that makes them constipated. So the goal of our therapy as teams of doctors and nurses working together is for the patient to achieve a regular comfortable defecation. Uh, that means that you know, it doesn't have to be daily, but the bowel motion does need to be soft in order for it to be comfortable. We want to relieve the patient's discomfort and improve their sense of well-being. And there are many, if not most, patients that feel so much better uh, if they can pass a regular bowel motion. If possible, we would like to restore their toileting independence to give them some sense of dignity. And we need to be able to titrate, to adjust the laxatives, to suit the individual and educate the patient and the family about how to adjust the medication as needed. Because um, with laxatives, it is not one size fits all. Uh, in any one family eating the same diet, everybody's gut uh, reacts a little differently to the food and fluid that they take in, in the same way that a patient, one patient may only need one physicodal every other day, another patient may need two twice a day. There's not really a lot of rhyme or reason about that, but the patients need to be educated and have the confidence to adjust their laxatives.
So the pharmacological measures that we can use, um, once more, it comes down to a fairly simple combination in the same way that for nausea and vomiting, we're looking at metoclopramide and haloperidol. With uh, constipation, where we are looking at bisacodyl and liquid paraffin. Bisacodyl is a stimulant laxative, so uh, it overcomes the gastric uh, stasis, and the liquid paraffin helps to lubricate uh, the feces on the way out, and a softener can um, allow more uh, fluid to stay within the gut so that the bowel motions are softer. For our group of palliative patients, we avoid the bulk forming laxatives and we avoid the osmotic laxatives. There may be patients who are using bulk forming laxatives and osmotic laxatives and are perfectly happy with them uh, and that's fine, they can continue on them, but we, we would not um, start them as someone who has not been using them. I mentioned earlier that 90% of patients on opioids will need regular laxatives. So it's important when we start patients on a strong opioid that we also prescribe the laxative. So if you can get into the habit, uh, if you're st starting morphine of prescribing bisacodyl, one to two HS as needed, and letting the patients know that they almost definitely you will notice a change in their bowels. As I explained before, uh, we use bisacodyl because it's a stimulant laxative which overcomes uh, the activity of opioid on the, in the gut, which reduces the propulsive activity. If the patient has not passed any feces for uh, three days, or if you have a history of um, long-standing constipation and then diarrhea, which would raise a suspicion for spurious diarrhea, then it may be that rectal measures will be needed. It is important uh, to do a PR because the patient may be and bowel obstruction higher up in the gut, in which case the rectum uh, would be empty, there'll be abdominal distension and may be reduced or increased bowel sounds. Physicodal also comes as a suppository uh, to help the rectum clear the feces. And uh, if the suppository is not effective, then a sodium phosphate enema can be used if there uh, is feces in the rectum, if there's a history of spurious diarrhea, then a uh, high up enema of two sodium phosphate enemas would be appropriate. And as many of you have mentioned, uh, the importance of non-pharmacological measures. So it's important for the patient to drink well, uh, to, to have a balanced diet. And as Odette mentioned, that having easy access uh, to the toilet uh, with privacy and, and plenty of time uh, to pass a bowel motion. It is possible for the toilet to come to the patient uh, with a provision of a chair commode and if possible, uh, encouraging the patient, if they're strong enough, to use a squatting position if that is um, a practical option for them. It may be that the reason that they're not getting up to go to the toilet is that they are in pain, in which case we need to address their pain as well. That is the end of the talk on constipation. Any comments or questions before we move on to the case study? Why we avoid bulk forming laxatives in 
and uh, uh, malignancy patients. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Why we avoid bulb forming uh, laxatives in? Uh, because with our drugs, we are slowing down the gut transit. So all we're doing is putting a whole lot of bulk into the gut, but nothing is pushing it along. Um, so we're, we're so we're going to add to abdominal distension uh, with with no propulsive activity. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you use uh, mineral cellulose, especially in patients with uh, opio, uh, who are taking opioids, you can see that uh, if you mix uh, the mineral cellulose with some water and keep it in, on a table, after some time it will become ha very hard. And uh, if you don't take water, enough water, then it is going to be uh, another cause for industrial obstruction, in addition to the constipation produced by the opioids. So it is usually advisable to avoid performing laxatives, especially in patients who are taking opioids. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So the, the advice that we're teaching today is that is it the same or different to the way that you would manage constipation at the moment in your patient. Anybody else? Pardon? Anybody else have any comments or questions? So if you don't have a question, I will ask you a question. So uh, this is about uh, vomiting. Uh, suppose uh, a man, he consumes two liters of beer in five minutes. Huh? And uh, he starts vomiting immediately. That's one uh, situation. And another situation is he starts vomiting after three hours. Then another situation is he starts vomiting next day. So what are the treatments for this? Consumes two liters of beer in five minutes and starts immediately, uh, vom uh, uh, start vomiting immediately. That's one situation. And another situation uh, after three hours and uh, next day. These are the three different situations. So what are the treatments for this? Uh, sir, in the first situation, mostly uh, prokinetic will help good because it is because of over distension and rapid consumption. In the, if it's after three hours, it's mostly because of a gastritis. So a proton pump inhibitor or a H2 blocker will help. And I do not know about the third option, but mostly it may be because of uh, 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 maybe it, uh, uh, forceful uh, means uh, vomiting may have a ruptured es uh, ruptured esophagus uh, with mediastinitis, uh, similar complication. This is just my guess because this has been reported that a patient with binge of al uh, alcohol they may have a. Uh, what is called call as Burhev syndrome, I suppose. Uh, so anybody else? Uh, so actually, uh, the today's teaching is on uh, nausea and vomiting. And uh, the message is that uh, um, there may be many patients with vomiting. Uh, so before treating vomiting, you should uh, know um, uh, which area is involved in vomiting, which receptors are involved. So uh, there are mainly uh, two centers, as uh, Delamy told, chemoreceptor, trogazone, and uh, the central coordinator is the vomiting center. But the vomiting center can be 
stimulated by uh, many inputs from chemoreceptor triggers on from the cortex, uh, from the vestibular apparatus, from the bowel, uh, and by the chemicals. So, um, uh, so depending on which area is stimulated, and uh, you have to know which uh, which are the receptors involved in each area, so that uh, you know that uh, which drug should be given. So in this patient. Um, he consumes two liter of uh, uh, beer in five minutes uh, and immediately starts vomiting. That means he has a distension. So there are stretch receptors in the bowel. So when stretch receptors are getting activated, that will start vomiting. Uh, so in this patient, um, uh, actually in the first situation, you need not give anything, but theoretically, as Dr. Barrett told, uh, prokinetic may help because uh, that will increase the peristalsis and will empty the um, gastric contents fastly and in the second situation actually uh, it is getting absorbed into the bloodstream and the chemicals uh, causes the vomiting chemicals causes stimulation of the chemoreceptor trigger zone so that chemoreceptor trigger zone uh, you have to the main receptors in the ctz are uh, d2 and 5ht3 so you may use uh, drugs which blocks uh, the d2 and 5ht3 so I may give a haloperidol or metoclopramide. And in the third situation, the patient starts vomiting on the next day. That means it, it is most probably due to the gastritis. So uh, proton pump inhibitors uh, may help. So here there are three, uh, three different situations with, um, uh, which cause vomiting with only one agent. And uh, three situations, you have to use three different agents. So that's the importance of knowing which are the centers involved in the vomiting and what are the receptors involved in the vomiting. So we will go for a case presentation. Dr. Baranidharan will present the... Uh, yes, yes. Am I audible? I think I am yes. audible. Yeah. 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 So can I use the screen here or change the slides? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We will change it from here. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is a patient who was admitted two days back in our department. He is a 66-year-old man who is a known case of customer stomach. Uh, it has complaints of nausea, vomiting, and pain abdomen for the last one month. Next slide. Uh, his symptoms are predominantly more after taking solid foods. And he also has a complaints of dull pain most all over the upper abdomen. The pain initially starts around 30 minutes after taking food and it lasts for around 4 to 5 hours or less. And... Uh, over a period of time, the pain slows down or it is relieved by vomiting after taking food. Next, next one. Now the patient uh, says that he has learned himself to restrict uh, to liquid diet and he is presently taking only liquid-based diets like uh, local kanji or porridge. And uh, over the last month, he says that uh, his pain is increasing in severity during the last 30 days or four weeks. Next. Yeah. This is a case of carcinoma stomach who was diagnosed in uh, September 2017. He was operated uh, with uh, subtotal gastrectomy and D1 lymphadenectomy. And pathology is reported as adenocarcinoma with close margin. The patient uh, defaulted further follow up or further evaluation or any adjuvant therapy. Now, next one. There is no other uh, significant past history. It's not a diabetic or no hypertensive or not on any long-term medications. Next. Next, next one. Yeah. The, presently, the patient request is to control his nausea, increase his food intake, and uh, have uh, some pain control. Uh, next one. On examination, uh, the patient is thin-built, is malnourished, 
uh, 66 year old with a performance score of 3 ecog performance score of 3 and he is little dehydrated pulse around 84 or more blood pressure is around 168 uh main uh, respiratory systems and cardiovascular systems are normal and on ex- uh, evaluation the hemoglobin level is around 7.6 with uh, renal function test and liver function test though within normal limits next one we did an ultrasound abdomen uh, it showed uh, no liver secondary sarcoidosis but ct abdomen showed uh, stomach wall thickening with the interface with the stomach and the stomach bed is not very clearly visible uh next one we did a uh, next one next line yeah uh, we did a uh, upper gi scopy uh, yesterday morning uh, sorry go back go back yeah uh, yes though he had a subtotal gastrectomy um at the anastomotic side there was an ulcerative proliferative lesion in the stomach which is almost occluding the lumen proximal uh, fundus and proximal part of the body appears normal there is no infiltration uh, i just uh, keep this for open can anybody give a how to proceed on because this a uh, case of carcinoma stomach was operated some 3 months back uh, supposed to be um, T2 or T3 lesion, but now he is uh, having a recurrence hardly in another four, uh, three months time with increasing pain, nausea, vomiting, with uh, low hemoglobin. He is not able to take food properly. Next one. Next one. Next one. Anybody can, uh, next one, yeah. anybody can open us on how we can uh, just manage his nausea vomiting we have few plans uh, he is really worried about his uh, inability to take a proper food his nutrition is being affected there is constant pain presently for last uh, a week or so how we can manage this next one next one Yeah, yeah yeah go back go back go back okay. yeah so what we did was uh, uh, we used uh, give a rails tube to as to decompress the abdomen uh, for pain we have managed with uh, paracetamol and uh, step to uh, milder opiates like tramadol we have started on iv fluids to correct his dehydration nutrition we have to slowly improvise upon mm. yeah next one so anybody is on? okay anyone who want to just add on to it uh, this is the future plan we are having uh, to do a diagnostic laparoscopy to assess if the case is operable and to do subtotal or total gastrectomy with the gastro jejunostomy or inoperable we'll just go for a feeding jejunostomy to improve his nutrition hemotherapy i don't think he will be fit enough uh, 66 years with low performance score i just uh, anybody want to just add on to the treatment plan this is the very Anyone? thank you thank you for this case yeah it's a yeah, really, yeah. really good case to discuss and in palliative medicine most of our decisions are, are collaborative so we certainly would appreciate everybody's um questions thoughts opinions about this this man who is in a, a pretty tricky situation and he doesn't really have a lot yeah. of voices but he has significant symptoms so please yeah um, yes please everybody contribute to the discussion yeah see uh, uh yeah please hello i am jagdish yes. hello varna sir how are you yeah fine jagdish please yes. come on sir can we add total parental nutrition for this patient as of now to improve 
Yeah, possible, possible, possible. Okay. okay. The thing is, uh, is a newly uh, okay recently diagnosed patient with cancer stomach. Three months back, he was operated, and I thought there will be a, some amount of chance whether we can redo another surgery to clear up all the disease. Before taking up for surgery, okay, total parental nutrition will be fine, just to push him up to to the anesthesia table. Yeah, true. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, so may I know what is the past previous history of surgery? What surgery was done previously? See, no, they have done only a subtotal. Supposed to be a subtotal gastrectomy with a D1 lipendectomy, uh, with the margin being around 1.5 centimeter proximally. Okay, can it be the vomiting may be due to loop obstruction, anastomotic loop obstruction, or distal loop or efferent loop obstruction? No, no, no. They have not done any gastrojejunostomy. Okay, they just oh. primarily anastomosed. I don't know. Yeah, you can go back. Go back in the history. Go back. Still more two three steps. Still more. Yeah, uh, yeah. Stop. Because already subtotal gastrectomy has been done. Then yeah, uh, I don't know <clears throat> whether it is subtotal or uh, only a anastomosis. What done? I don't know because they have not specified whether a gastrojejunostomy has been done or not. Okay. Okay. It was done in some uh, uh, primary center somewhere. We are also perplexed. What was the surgery there? Okay. It's okay. Uh, come to the penultimate side. The last word one. Yeah. Slide number thirteen. Yeah. One three. Yeah. Oh, no, go back. Ah, yes. Uh, this is what our plan is. Uh, he is being a poor performance score patient. Uh, I don't think, uh, see, if possible, we can do a diagnostic lab and uh, assess what actually the surgery is being done. And if operable, we'll try to clear the disease. Or else, uh, we just give a feeding gesnostomy so as to improve his nutrition and uh, stop his oral intake. That's the maximum we are planning. For main glaze, presently we are giving a para, a parastamol and tramadol. Uh, if it is not going to get relieved, maybe we are going to improve, uh, increase on up to morphine tablets. Neurolysis, maybe we'll try. Uh, presently, we don't have that facility in our institute. A celiac neurolysis, maybe try, but uh, we don't have that facility here. I think uh, chemotherapy can be kept as a least of op last option. Yeah, that's the last option. Yeah, I've not even, uh, I've just not even thought of it. Mm. Uh, just suppose if with uh, feeding gastrostomy he improvises, maybe with improved nutrition you can try out. Not an option right now. Suppose uh, this patient uh, has an inoperable uh, CS stomach. And uh, yeah, yes, sir. so what would be his uh, pro uh, prognosis, uh, his uh, longevity? Longevity will be around, uh, given his uh, poor performance score and uh, poor nutrition, maybe around six, few months. Few months. Uh, I don't uh, see, not more than a year. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, so I, I think uh, uh, you have to, uh, do the patient know about the disease? Yeah, definitely. He knows about it. So is it um, good to talk to the patient uh, regarding what you think about the disease and uh, what are the benefits uh, in, yeah. in terms of... Yeah, true, true. The problem is he's a 66-year-old with hard of hearing illiterate, how far he can understand the issues. 
he just simply says okay just relieve me of my pain i am fine with it nothing more he is willing to listen at all okay and, and, uh, in that case uh, he only has a reasonable uh, his son who can make a little decision okay yeah. just managing with that yeah i think uh, you need to talk to the nearest uh, caregiver regarding what you think of the disease and uh, okay. if uh, if you are going to do a diagnostic lab what are you going to achieve with that and with that finding uh, what are you going to do if it is uh, inoperable or operable so i think uh, this mm-hmm. discussion should be there uh, so that uh, mm-hmm. they can have uh, some decision how to go about it. Uh, so uh, sometimes yeah. the patient uh, son may think that okay no i will not go uh, with any surgery we will go for something else means uh, we will not go for any chemotherapy or surgery we will continue to yeah. be uh, like this and uh, if possible give me good symptoms at all that may be the one option otherwise mm-hmm. they may go for uh, surgery i don't know but uh, you have to talk to the patient's uh, son and uh, Uh, if possible patient also uh, for the time being yeah. i think uh, because the patient has vomiting uh, whatever you give orally uh, there's a chance that uh, he is going to vomit it up so he is going to vomit yeah so yeah. the medications for pain relief and uh, uh, for vomiting it should be given subcutaneously or uh, intravenously uh, for this yeah intravenously uh, yeah so, Uh, there are many chances uh, for uh, vomiting but i think uh, one of the most important thing may be uh, the stomach has a reduced capacity uh, which can uh, cause yeah. vomiting and in addition uh, maybe a, a recurrence or some uh, tumor obstructing uh, somewhere else uh, in the gi tract so i think uh, dexamethasone uh, may be tried in this patient so that uh, it will Steroids. reduce the tumor edema and uh, it can uh, help in the situation so the, the dexamethasone would oh. be a trial it will need to be administered um, iv and a 3 day course of um, 8 to 16 mg daily may open up that gastric outlet oh okay okay i have not tried on dexamethasone okay we will learn about it maybe next week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe. 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 Maybe I should try out. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So it's a it's a trial. It's not something the patient stays on. Yeah, I can understand that. Actually, I thought uh, with the physically uh, rails tube decompressing the stomach, I thought. Okay. Okay. I'll give a try out of uh, dexamethasone. I'll try it. Uh, similarly, the pain relief uh, will will probably need to be administered. Um, subcut or iv in order to be effective yeah iv trimodal yeah. yeah and the paracetamol is he having see paracetamol he is taking orally we are just uh, huckling around actually he takes around the uh, trimodal only after uh, rails tube insertion we have stopped all these kind of stuffs on iv fluids and uh, trimodal iv uh, trimodal after putting rails we have not upscaled him to morphine Uh, I think he is fine with tramadol. I don't want to upscale him right now. After putting rails to, does he has uh, relief of vomiting? Yeah, I have stopped his oral intake. I have just put him on uh, IV fluids and uh, oh. things. He is fine. So I have. Uh, but the thing is, the counts are not uh, still comfortable enough for me to push to anesthesia table. Uh, so we are planning a few transfusions one or two units of transfusion to improve his hemoglobin then uh, we take him for surgery um i i have cared for a handful of patients with stomach cancer and okay and the the rails tube has for every one of them been the most effective um relief for their nausea and vomiting mm-hmm. so they have not okay. actually needed medication it's because with the okay. with, that, with the blockage to their gastric outlet the the cause of their nausea and vomiting is that stomach distension and if you can relieve okay. that on a regular basis then then usually that symptom is very well controlled yes can i can yeah. i um thanks sunil 
not knowing the situation with cost of surgery versus chemotherapy for this patient. I okay. mean, in some gastric cancers, you know, they can get symptomatic relief with yeah, chemotherapy, possibly. Gentle, but, uh, gentle chemotherapy, 5-FU or something. Um, yeah, possibly. And, but, and uh, I mean, surgery is potential. So it's not an easy... I don't know if surgery is any less dangerous than chemotherapy in, in a patient as unwell as this. Yes. I'm wondering so, how, you're, how you're adding that up, how you're weighing that up. The thing is, uh, he has been operated just a few months back. Uh, I think possibly the intention of the surgeon should be a curative one. It's hardly three months now. Uh, I think the I think the time between and, I think the time between previous surgery and now and recurrence is kind of irrelevant. And this man is not curable. Maybe. No, uh, he what what I really would say he would not be. His, this man is not curable, and so. Um, if the, you know, the idea of doing surgery for symptomatic relief um, is reasonable. Sorry. Okay. So you wanted to say something, sorry. Yeah, the thing is, uh, is uh, CT and uh, ultrasound development doesn't have any extensive ascites or liver metastasis, any signs of uh, metastatic disease. Uh, a diagnostic lab is not a such a difficult procedure. It's only hardly takes around a small uh, button hole near the umbilicus to see what is there inside. We can sustain it. If it is operable, then we can proceed on. Or else, a simple feeding gesinostomy will be much more helpful for him so that he can have good amount of nutrition. Something has to, he has to take it. Uh, yeah, uh, that makes sense. sense. I, I remember a patient that um, I saw in India once who was being taken to surgery. Um, and, and it's different to your patient because hopefully you'll be able to discuss this, the, the pros and cons of the operation and, you know, likely benefits versus risks. But this lady yeah. made it very... This lady actually had a um, benign problem, a... a, a, a an abscess around a previous gallbladder cholecystectomy. Okay. So okay. the incentive was very much that she should um, have the surgery, that it would be a curative thing. But she was making it very, very, very clear that she didn't want to go to surgery. However, the medical opinion was that the surgery was a curative procedure and that really she needed to have surgery. Unfortunately, the lady died on the operating table. Um, yeah, surgery. Uh, surgery so, is not just, yeah, so that. it's important to. It's like a cakewalk. It's not like uh, having a coffee at a coffee shop. Exactly. It has its own risk. But, uh, Especially with a debilitated patient. You have benefits and uh, risk that has been there. Okay. I agree. And it's, it's often not, not easy to weigh it up because we can't foretell the future. <laughs> but, it, you know, they, they are difficult decisions. Uh, maybe uh, the advantage you're going to take out of surgery is a little higher here because we can somehow make uh, the food pipe in, in continuity so that he can take uh, food naturally, if not possible, at least by a feeding gesinostomy. That makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, that, that, yes, I agree. But that's another question because there's very little evidence to show that feeding patients with you know, progressive cancer actually sustain and prolongs life or puts on weight or does anything really to help the metabolic um, situation of the patient. I don't know if Sunil or Dalami or others have had experience with that, but um, unless, unless you're trying to build somebody up for surgery, there seems to be very limited role for for nasogastric feeding in this kind of situation, I think. Nasogastric feeding is possible if we can uh, negotiate our uh, tube towards the jejunum, which maybe may not be possible. 
that is that is yeah obstruction possible obstruction okay fine if no, not, physically physically you can get the feed the feed in but even then sometimes it aggravates nausea and vomiting but but it's more whether it actually prolongs life i mean what what would the purpose of the feeding be hopefully i guess you're aiming to try and prolong life by feeding this patient yeah. but i don't know if there's evidence that it actually achieves that unfortunately do others have evidence to show me that i'm wrong i may be wrong here but the last i looked i don't think there was convincing it makes us feel we're doing something that's the seems to be the bottom line with uh, feeding in this situation unfortunately and patients and families also feel that we're doing something uh, so that's a big part of it too i think Sunil, sorry, you were going to say something. No, uh, if this patient has an advanced malignancy, uh, which is inoperable, then feeding the genostomy uh, to improve nutrition, uh, I would not advise it is to improve the nutrition because it is not going to help the patient if the patient has an advanced malignancy because it doesn't uh, going to add any muscle mass or because the patient uh, naturally will have will be going into the pathetic uh, phase. So, mm -hmm. in order to... So, okay, uh, in that case, what can be done? We'll just uh, start him on uh, opioids and uh, thirty parental uh, nutrition. No, if this patient has an advanced malignancy, if you feel that, uh, then uh, we won't... Uh, uh, if the patient comes to us uh, in an uh, inoperable state, then uh, we would try to uh, maybe if it is due to some obstruction we will try with uh, steroids uh, to get uh, some relief for the patient so that they will be able to take orally but if that is not possible at all then we will think of okay. uh, subcutaneous administration of fluids so this uh, we can give uh, maybe uh, even 500 to 1000 ml of uh, normal saline per day through subcutaneous route uh, subcutaneous, sir. Eh? Yeah, subcutaneous route is uh, one of the parental route which is underutilized, uh, and uh, it 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 is as equivalent to the absorption is as equivalent to the oral route. Uh, so maybe 500 ml, 100 ml per hour you can administer. The only problems that uh, uh, can occur are uh, maybe a swelling. swelling. Yeah. But uh, that swelling uh, itself, uh, it, it will be uh, relieved after some time. Uh, you need not do anything. Uh, so some swelling is a natural. But if there is a huge swelling, then you have to stop the infusion. For yeah, there will be aspect. definitely there will be tissue stretching. There will be much more bigger pain. Okay, okay. if you can have IV access, then okay. No, uh, because this patient may live for uh, one or two months, I don't know. So, in that case, uh, it may be difficult to get uh, IV access. So, uh, for long-term administration of fluids, subcutaneous route may be the easier one. Because you need not pop the patient uh, for um, 100 times to get an IV line. So, just one click and you are there. So, uh, and uh, you can... Um, Keep the subcutaneous line for five to seven days. Whether you uh, while you have to remove the IV line after three days, and the chance of infection are also less with the subcutaneous in, uh, line. So these are the advantages of subcutaneous line. Okay. Um, the, what comes to mind for me is the importance of the palliative approach, and we've talked um, in previous weeks um, about expecting the worst and hoping for the best and i can hear um, that you are hoping for the best for your patient which is the right thing but i think it is equally important to communicate um, to the family at least if not the patient that his prognosis could be as short as two weeks uh, so that if there are things that he needs to put in order or prioritize that he has an opportunity to do that Okay. So this patient has a ECG score of uh, three, isn't it? Mm. So yeah. would it be advisable to um, take him for surgery because he's um, no? It's, it's only an option. Um, okay. See, every I think is only an open option. Okay. 
can't take decision right now yeah i think uh, it is uh, most important to if talk only he is going to be fit enough for anything yeah i think uh, you have to talk to the caregiver and uh, and if possible to the patient uh, yeah uh, with uh, giving the option and what are the risk and benefits involved in it and then you have to come to a decision and i think uh, you have to try uh, a trial of uh, dexamethasone okay Audit, one minute, one minute, audit. You are not audible. Let me unmute you. Yeah. Sorry. No, yeah. I was just saying, I th thank you. I, I think it's a very good case to discuss because it, it shows so many of the complexities of managing patients like this at the end of life. And, um, you know, it's almost at extremes. You can go from feeling like you're doing absolutely nothing to doing something quite um, in invasive and how to how to make the decision for the individual can be quite complex. Anyway, thank you for bringing it up. Does anybody have any other questions or comments about uh, the case studies or the discussion that we've had? So I think the discussion has been, it's been a heavy discussion. Uh, this is a very um, sick and sad uh, patient and a difficult situation for his medical team. Uh, and thank you for, for presenting this case. I hope we have been able to give you um, some useful um, information to, to use. But does anybody have any other comments regarding this case? <coughs> so our time is nearly up. Um, I, uh, some of you may know, or you may all know that I have been um, putting together the, writing the learning summaries for each session. <coughs> but because I presented today, I, I won't, um, I won't rewrite my PowerPoint discussion. But what I will do is, is put together information about uh, the use of subcutaneous fluids and also perhaps some information around the use of nasogastric feeding uh, at the end of life, because I think that's been an important part of our discussion today. Okay, good. Thank you for everybody's <coughs> contribution. <coughs> See you next week. Thank you. Thank <coughs> you.